All right, so <clears throat> in a little bit, we're going to go through a demo of how things work in, in uh, with live migrations. But you have to think back to the days when you wanted to be able to move workloads around and you either use clustering or you used, um, you could do VMware vMotion. Um, when Windows came onto the scene with the virtualization and server uh, 2008 or even the um, some of the earlier releases, there really was no way to do that or do it well. And now in server 2008, if you got into clustering, then you could do some live migration work. But then again, there were some restrictions there. So a lot of people didn't take it that seriously, and, and rightly so, because it could be done so much easier on an ASX uh, farm uh, with vCenter. Um, in 2012, things have shifted dramatically. So now we can do live migrations faster than ever before. Um, there's really no need for um, uh, clustered volumes or a clustered environment. If you if you want to do live migrations, you can do those from one node to another. So um, and those can be standalone nodes. So it's, it's a whole new idea. Um, you know, in a VMware world, you still need that virtual center component. Um, you couldn't just install two S ESXi hosts on the same network and then try to do vMotions. Um, that was just not something that was done. Um, so when Live Migration came out and it gave you the ability to use things like SMB Direct, 10 gigabit network bandwidth, um, or, or, or beyond that, uh, it really opens the door for way faster migrations of, of workloads. Talk about what, you know, going back to what Matt talked about, running in a cluster is great. You can do cluster aware updating, uh, where it moves machines around, or, uh, you know, the live migration component. But, you know, I really like the idea of being able to move a machine across maybe a, a metropolitan area based on throughput, as long as I've got network connectivity and my storage is all up and synced, then I really don't have to worry about any of those restrictions or having additional software components installed in my environment just to move a workload. So I really like how that piece works. Um, and especially, let's say you're running two nodes and you have a file share uh, that has your virtual machines you can actually do a live migration, not move anything other than the actual running workload from one server to another, and the VM and all its files on that file share. Now, it only works with SMB3, which was introduced in 2012, like we talked about earlier. Okay, as long as that IP connection is there between the two hosts, the configuration moves over to the new to the new target host. The memory is then copied across or transferred. And then the modified pages are transferred. Anything that's changed since we started this process, as we uh, as that's finished, the storage uh, check is is handled. You know everything's there. Okay, great. Let's move let's ha move that storage handle over to that target host, and everything is good. In the demo, I'll talk through a little bit about um, the console itself, and uh, you know a lot of people will think through well. You know, it's probably using some type of RDP. Well, that's just not the case. Uh, the console inside of Server 2012 and Server 2012 RV um, is actually doing a tunnel into the console of the virtual machine as if you were sitting at a physical server and sitting at the uh, at the rack and going through the console software. So it's actually going into the console. And when I do a live migration in the demo later, you'll see how the screen will blink. Now. Um, I won't give away some of the hit, some of the stuff behind that demo, but um, if you're paying attention, there's no way RDP could play a role. So you'll see that later on. Um, what R2 gives us is the ability to, to do live migration with compression. So the memory is then compressed as it's being written across to that target host. So configuration data moves across, memory contents moved across, but that's compressed and transferred, and then the modified pages. Then the storage handle is moved. This is a two-time improvement over the 2012 live migration performance. Not to mention when you add on RDMA. We'll talk about that in a bit. So harnessing RDMA to accelerate live migration. This component was not there before. You had to do a manual file copy process to take care to, to take advantage of RDMA in 2012. Um, now that that process or the ability for RDMA to be called and used is actually embedded in the live migration 
components or the, the actual engine behind that. So basically all you're doing is when you right click and you say I want to live migrate from one server to another, um, as long as you have set up live migration to enable uh, SMB direct, then you're able to take advantage of those uh, of that particular function. Uh, so it, it'll actually use the RDMA components and, and talk through and discuss what is the fastest way to go and uh, move the bits that way. So uh, you actually remove the compression algorithm at that point because honestly, it's just not necessary. Um, it's the thing is so fast with RDMA and the 56 gig capabilities that um, it is the absolute fastest way to do a live migration. The demos that are out there uh, from TechEd uh, can show that piece off really well where they reduce a live migration of a very, very high I.O. system down to like, I think it's like eight seconds or something. It's ridiculous. So take a look at that uh, if you get time. That's out on, uh, on channel nine as well. So we'll talk through. Uh, I'll go through the whole demo process of our, I think we kind of got the idea there, uh, <clears throat> storage live migration. So people in the VMware realm, you might have known this as a uh, storage vMotion. Um, back in the day, it used to be a command line feature, right? It evolved and became something that was embedded into the GUI and virtual center. Um, in 2012, you're actually, when you run a move, when you right click a VM and say move VM, it actually asks you, do I want to move this machine live, do I want to only move the data, um, or do I want to move the data and put it into one place? Uh, so that would be moving the config files, the data files, and all those things, moving them to one central place. Um, so it gives you those options. It's not a different right click. It's not a different set of commands that you have to go run. It's none of that. It will just ask you in the wizard, what do you want to do? So um, <clears throat> what you're able to do here is make sure that the, the, the bits are moved across from one storage device to another storage device, uh, which is what you choose during the wizard, and the machine stays running. The virtual stays running. Once everything is migrated over, Hey, it keeps on running, and the, and the writes start going to the target device. That's how it works. Shared nothing live migration, that is basically all of what I just talked about squished together into one thing. We're moving a virtual machine from one host to another host. We're moving the source data, the VHDs, from one source to another source. And we're moving that workload real time across the wire to another destination server, and that's how Shared nothing, live migration works. All that's required is an IP connection. And that's when it's complete. Now, for upgrades, this was something that Microsoft promised back in, uh, back when some of you in the 2008 days may have felt that pain where you're trying to get the 2008 R2 or you're, uh, you're trying to, to upgrade and the ability to live migrate from one OS uh, or one release to another just wasn't uh, allowed. Microsoft now promises that all uh, future releases of the OS or hypervisor um, will allow for the backwards compatibility of being able to, to live migrate from an older server to a newer server. So now I can move those virtual machine workloads live to my newly installed R2 machine without going down, and then I can upgrade my old 2012 server to R2. Okay, that's just a for instance. It is a one-way migration, mind you. Um, so there's not backward backward compatibility. You can't go from 2012 to 2012 R2 and then change your mind and want to live mi migrate back to 2012. That is not supported, uh, however. But just having that ability to move workloads live. Um, really helps, especially in cluster situations uh, where you can take a cluster node out, um, upgrade it to 2012 R2, migrate those, live migrate those workloads over to it uh, into, a, into the new cluster. That makes things so much simpler than it was in the 2008 R2 days. Okay, so just want to touch on that. Live cloning. Introduced in R2 is the ability to right click and create a clone of a virtual machine. You do not need virtual machine manager. Um, it comes with any release of server 2012 
or Hyper-V 2012 R2. So what it does is it says, hey, if I've got a virtual machine or I've got a checkpoint of a virtual machine, then let's go ahead, right-click on that guy and say export. It's not called clone, it's called export. And it'll let you export that machine the way it looks at that point in time, either the virtual machine as it stands or the checkpoint as it stands when you took the checkpoint. And that is how you create a clone. All right. So we're going to jump through this. I want to save some time. We're trying to catch up a little bit and save some time for uh, later so that Matt can do a little more time on VMM if, uh, if, we, if we have some time left. Um, some people have been asking about Linux support on Hyper-V. Um, just a, this is just a, uh, a quick list of things that have been added from a, a Linux perspective on Hyper-V and uh, R2. So virtual SCSI, hot add, online resize, yes, that is available now in R2. 64 vCPU SMP is available. Um, this includes Red Hat, SUSE, OpenSUSE, CentOS, and Ubuntu. Um, you've got live backup. That's something that wasn't there before. Full dynamic memory support has been added. Um, and uh, deep integration services support. So uh, there's been a lot of work done to make sure the Linux workloads can run really well inside of the new Hyper-V 2012 R2. Just another VMware comparison slide just to throw out there. Um, I'll let you jump into this later. Go check out that white paper. Um, for now, let's go ahead and roll with the demo and talk a little bit about live migration. OK, so let's jump into the next part of our demo. Right now, what we want to talk about is live migration. Live migration, storage live migration, or shared nothing live migration. Um, as a former VMware consultant, I, re I can remember back to, you know, when I was first beginning ESX, and we would sit back and watch the emotions happen. It was just amazing. It was something that, for a, for the geeky, nerdy side of, of uh, the IT pro, um, there was a lot of giggling. It was fun. Well, in Hyper-V, in the past, you had to uh, be a part of the cluster. Now, that's just not the case. So I can do live migrations between uh, hosts. I can uh, live migrate from uh, 2012 up to a 2012 R2. So uh, avoid that downtime scenario that used to occur. Um, but let's jump in now, and, then, and let's take a look and see what all it takes to get this set up. All right, so the first, thing, first things first, we need to make sure that the Hyper-V uh, server is set up. Um, and, and live migrations, you have to make sure they're set up on both ends. And there's some uh, caveats to this as well. So let's right click on Hyper-V EI 01 and go into Hyper-V settings. All right, we skipped over this a minute ago, so I'm going to jump in now and show this piece. Um, in the live migrations area, I have enable incoming and outgoing live migrations. I can select the network to, for those to be a part of. I can even say how many uh, simultaneous live migrations uh, do I want to allow for this host. I've seen uh, videos, uh, if you can go out to uh, Channel 9 and look up some of the Tech Ready or, or Tech Ed videos um, that are out there, there was some live migrations around 64 at one time from one uh, Hyper-V host, so quite significant. Um, going to, going to uh, also zoom in here, I want to show uh, some of the advanced features. So. Uh, when you enable <clears throat> live migrations, you have to just select, do I want to have credentials supplied? In other words, I have to be logged on to the uh, host server to perform that live migration, or can I use Kerberos? And when you, can, when you use Kerberos, what it does is it says, okay, server, we're going to let the server have rights to move workloads between uh, one Hyper-V host to another. So it's using the host as the credential. Uh, and I want to show that piece off, and uh, we're going to jump into Active Directory users and computers in just a moment, and I'll show you that piece. But uh, constrained delegation is something that is, is new and um, can trip people up, so I wanted to uh, show that piece off. <clears throat> also, in this particular area is where you can turn on uh, compression, and uh, well, compression is turned on by, by default. You can also turn on SMB Direct. So if your network cards uh, in, in this case, if network cards had RDMA capabilities, you would be able to then uh, turn on the SMB Direct, and that is a super fast way of doing live migrations. Um, basically, it bypasses having to do all that CPU crunching at the host level and offloads all of the uh, uh, work to the network card uh, and uh, directly can tap into the memory uh, of the host and, and uh, move 
uh, files or uh, uh, get that workload, that live migration going uh, super fast. Um, and also free up the, uh, the CPU on the host a little better too. Um, but that's where you would select that piece. Um, in the same area, before we jump out and look at Active Directory users and computers, uh, storage migration. So this one, um, you know, be a little more careful here. How many uh, storage migrations can occur from this host to another host at one time? Um, I would say, you know, this is more based on the I.O. of the server. Uh, how many uh, simultaneous migrations can occur? I would probably leave this at two unless you know uh, just what you're dealing with as far as uh, uh, bandwidth is concerned. All right, so let's go ahead and jump out of Hyper-V Manager for just a second. I've already got this uh, particular piece already configured, so I'm going to jump out of um, my live migration area here, and we're going to go back to Server Manager. I'm going to right-click on my domain controller and choose Active Directory Users and Computers. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in there. And let's go ahead and right-click on hyper VDI 01 and go to Properties. Now, you'll notice there is a Delegation tab. And delegation is where we can go in and specify specific services and the computers that we trust. So hyper VDI 01, uh, notice that it is already set up with SIFS, which is that uh, SMB protocol, the ability to uh, talk and, uh, and use shares. Um, Hyper-V Replica, and then there are two other virtualization services. Let me go ahead and expand that out just a little bit before we do that. There's System Migration Service, so that's doing your live migration, right? And then there's also the Console Service, which is the ability to console into a particular virtual machine, right? So those two services there. Notice at the top I have Trust this Computer for Delegation, these specified services only. Um, and also you can choose any authentication protocol uh, or you can go with Kerberos only. Uh, completely up to you. Uh, but that delegation piece, this is new and a lot of people get tripped up on this when they're trying to do um, replication uh, is one of the ones I've seen uh, some questions from some of the forums uh, because they forget this particular part and they say hey I got replicas working fine while I'm remoted into the server but as soon as I remote or log out of the server, uh, log out of the RDP session, um, the replicas quit working. Well, this is why. So uh, you want to make sure that you've um, enabled uh, this piece uh, per each host and who it's trusting. Okay. And this is also a really good thing because uh, for especially like in a financial institution or uh, healthcare, anywhere where you've got some, uh, you've got to a really uh, uh, high uh, security awareness. Um, this would require the Active Directory administrators uh, to allow those particular servers uh, the ability to do these these type of tasks. So a new server couldn't just show up on the network just because I had rights on the domain um, as an admin wouldn't mean that I could actually live migrate machines or workloads over to this new server. I would actually have to go through my Active Directory um, uh, process of getting uh, that machine added to the domain um, and then the delegation rights have to be added um, so uh, another level of security there which I think is a really good thing I've seen uh, several places where uh, complete virtual machines were exported or live or uh, uh, motioned over to a, a new ESX host and that ESX host would walk right out of the building if nobody was paying attention uh, so it's you know kind of that kind of restrains it down to physical security at that point. Um, I, I really like having this extra layer and for most institutions now uh, or companies you're you're really uh, separating the, the uh, security practice to that Active Directory admin uh, to do this kind of thing. So just let them know there's some new stuff coming their way. They got to look at delegation. All right, so we're going to go ahead and hop back out. I've already done this for both of my servers, so that's a good thing. It's already taken care of. All right. Now, let's go back over and look at Hyper-V Manager again. And this time, I'm going to click on Hyper-VDI 02. I've got a Tier 1 application running, and I'm going to go ahead and pop in and take a look at this guy. So let's go ahead and double-click, and there he is, Duke Nukem. Everybody remembers that guy. 
Well, he's off shooting and uh, doing his thing. He's running around. Everybody's happy. All right. So let's do a live migration. First thing I'm going to do, right click on tier one app. That's my virtual machine. And I'm going to click on move. Okay. So let's go ahead and right click, click on move. And now it's going to ask me, am I going to move the virtual machine or am I going to move the virtual machine storage? Okay. In this particular case, I'm going to move the entire virtual machine and everything, uh, the storage and everything. But it's asking me to differentiate here because it could just move the storage from one place to another while the machine is running. All right. So I'm going to choose move the virtual machine, click next. And this is where I'm going to go in and, and type in a host. All right. So I'm already running on Hyper VDI 02 and I'm going to move this guy over to Hyper VDI 01. All right. And if I want to, I can choose Browse, but I'm going to go ahead and hit Next. Um, now, this particular screen is going to reiterate. Are we moving the, the virtual machine's data, uh, all of the machine's data? That means the configuration files, the virtual hard drives, um, everything that has to do with snapshots or, or I should say checkpoints now in R2, um, all those things at one place, uh, to one place now. Or um, are we going to put different files in different places so we can select where they may move to in different folders? Or we're only going to move the virtual machine and we would use that bottom option uh, only in the case where uh, the virtual hard drives and configuration files and such all already resided on a centralized uh, share, uh, maybe a, a SMB share. Okay? So, Let's go ahead and hop and let's we'll say move the virtual machine's data to a single location and click next. And now when I click on the browse button, it's going to show me the particular server um, that I've already pointed at. And I can say, where do I want things to sit? And I can go ahead and click on VM storage folder. It's automatically pulling up that folder list from that remote server. So I'll go ahead and click VM storage, select folder, click next. Now it's going to give me just a overview of everything that we've already discussed and uh, notice that the move method is compression based uh, that's the default so I'll go ahead and click on finish now you'll see Duke Nukem there running and then you'll see it drop but did Duke Nukem stop running no Duke Nukem stayed running the only reason that you see the console drop is because of that reconnection because we're actually tunnel tunneling in to that particular virtual machine console through the host. So now if I go to Hyper VDI 01, I'll see there's my tier one app running, and I can see that Duke is still happily running around shooting things. That's uh, just a high level. There is one thing I want to show um, when it comes to the settings of a virtual machine. Uh, and this is uh, this gets into, if you're a VMware admin, then you're aware of where you do masking, where you go between, um, you know, processors that are of different types or speeds. Um, if you expand the processor and go to compatibility, this is where you can turn on with a single checkbox, migrate to a physical computer with different processor version. And once you turn this on, you'll be able to do live migration between uh, unlike hardware. Now, there's uh, one thing here, you have to have the machine shut down first in order to turn the setting on. And that, but once you've uh, enabled the setting, you can bring it up and shut it down all you'd like, uh, and, it, and it stays with the virtual machine. Just wanted to highlight that. That's uh, one thing that we needed to, to show during this part of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the session.